to the facts. This is Talk. Thank you for joining me. Um, my next guest is, well, if, if you've watched or listened to this show, um, you'll know that I'm p- uh, particularly keen to have him on when, whenever he um, is available. Uh, he's just a fount of information, really makes you think, and that is what this show is all about. And by the way, the number's on the screen if you want to talk about anything we're discussing. Uh, 0344 You can text the word TALK to 87222 or exit TALK TV. There is so much conflict in the world. We could talk about what's going on in w- between uh, Israel what's hap- and, and uh, Gaza. Um, we can talk about all, you know, Ethiopia. We can talk all, all over the world. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that the Sunday Times has done a brilliant piece of journalism about the SAS murders that happened in Afghanistan. British special forces are accused of holding killing contests and planting weapons on their Afghan victims. Now, previously classified files show how one of their own is trying to bring them to justice. Uh, I do really, if you if you can access, if you can have a look online at that Times report or actually buy the newspaper, I really recommend that you do it. Um, the reason I, I we turn to Sam Vaknin is because I want to talk about the psychology and especially when it comes to Israel and Gaza, many other places where ordinary people, I mean, ordinary people either sign up or are cons- conscripted what makes one person put on a uniform when we're, we're not programmed to kill? I mean, what makes somebody cross a line to commit what we know as war crimes? Um, and and uh, what makes somebody else decide to actually speak out against that behavior? Because with that becomes threat you are no longer one of us you're one of them it's an interesting dynamic uh so as i said right at the top of this sam vaknin is a professor of clinical psychology also a geopolitical analyst and and joins me now sam thank you so much for your time it is an interesting one isn't it because let's let's talk about somebody puts on a uniform uh and i'm you may well know there might be a difference from those who choose it as a career, but most people who do choose it as a career, I'm sure it's not to kill. They never think they'll be drafted into war until they are. And those who are conscripted to do it. What happens to make an ordinary person cross a line and maybe keep crossing a line to commit what we what we call rightfully call a war crime and what makes somebody else say you know what this is wrong this is wrong i cannot stomach it i cannot do it i will do something about it they're two very different mindsets yes first of all good to see you again trisha um and thank you for having me the first thing to understand is that there is a transition from one environment to another Do you know when we are online, for example, we are much more aggressive than in real life. When we are on a vacation, when we go on a holiday, we behave very differently. We are much more disinhibited. We do crazy things, which we wouldn't consider doing while, you know, we're embedded in our daily life. And this is war. War is the equivalent of a three-dimensional video game, a kind of permissive environment where everything is possible because nothing is real. War is a very disorienting experience, and the environment is so distant, so alien, that one has the um, bizarre sensation that one has been transported into another planet, and that all, all bets are off, and all rules can be broken with impunity and immunity. So this environmental dislocation is very important. Next thing, when you're at war, you are forced to choose between evils. War is among the few human experiences where there is no choice between good and evil. There's always a choice between two evils. And depending on your upbringing and, you know, you may wish to choose 
the lesser evil, but it, it's always evil. Take, for example, the following dilemma. Should you participate in killing civilians or should you snitch on your colleagues and buddies who've had your back during the war, who've saved your life maybe? Yeah. So these are, this is a dilemma that creates moral ambivalence and creates enormous dissonance and it's very, very difficult to reconcile and to, and to reach a conclusion and a decision under this, under this enormous stress and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I've, had, I've had a first-hand experience in all this, so I'm, I'm, a, bit, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit unusually yeah. involved in, in what I'm saying. And so yeah. everything, everything is fuzzy, everything is ambiguous, everything is equivocal and ambivalent, uh, there's no clear definition of what is right and what is wrong. Um, there's a sense of loss of control. Yes, Trisha, you wanted say, to ask that. I was going to say, Sam, you, you, you said, depending on your upbringing, and people don't think that when you put on a uniform, when you're or conscripted, when you go into war, that behind you comes, or with you, comes your upbringing how you were parented your belief systems just just if you would talk a little bit about that how does that impact on you because i'm thinking as as with with israel for instance the orthodox uh jews not wanting to be conscripted because at the core of their their soul their being their upbringing there and and judaism is not just something you go to synagogue and and that's it it's it's day to day practices and and what have you and and that runs counter to going into to war so so how uh, that's one example but how does your upbringing um have a bearing on whether you choose the more evil evil or the less evil evil if i can put it that way well, the fact of the matter is that only very few soldiers commit war crimes, fortunately for all of us. It's an outlier. It's an exception. These are rogue units and rogue soldiers. And this is a strong indicator that upbringing, personality structure, personal experience, autobiography, exposure uh, to varying cultures and, and societies and so on and so forth, do have a bearing on whether you end up committing a war crime or not. So if you, for example, grew up in an environment which led to the internalization of moral edicts, social mores, and inhibitions, you're far less likely to commit a war crime than if you were raised in an environment which was lax, morally speaking, or even antisocial. Um, and if you were exposed to a variety of cultures and, and societies and, and regions of the world and, and languages and so on and so forth, you're again less likely to commit war crimes than if we were raised up in a homogenous, ethnically or otherwise homogenous group with its own in-group and out-group dynamics. So this is very critical, absolutely. And it also means that you could educate soldiers to not commit war crimes. If this, ah. is indeed, if this is indeed a priority of the fighting forces, then we could reach a situation where war crimes would become obsolete. It, they are definitely a function of social conditioning, education, inhibition, and other psychological processes which could be inculcated and could be acquired. It's very important to understand. This doesn't, doesn't happen out of context and in the blue, out of the blue, you know? Yeah, so it's not enough just to give a, a, a soldier training and, and assume they are all on the same level and send them into war. You've got to give them that background training and, and not assume that they've had those sorts of things that you're talking about inculcated in them in their childhood. Sam, we've got to end it there. I mean, I could, I, whenever I meet you and we talk, I'm always <laughs> like, 
gosh, I could spend so much time. It's just so wonderful uh, to have you on the show. And I know everybody in the control room, uh, you always uh, start so many discussions um, and for very good reason. We're very, very lucky. As I said, we've got such a brilliant caliber of guests on this show. Sam Vaknin, Professor of Clinical Psychology and geop uh, Geopolitical Analyst there, talking about what makes somebody commit a war crime. We'll be back with more in a moment.